option. My name is Michael Merrington. I am the general manager of Index. We thank you for coming and apologies for the delays. So what is hydrogen? Well, it's the lightest and most abundant element in our universe. It's never alone. It's found usually in uh, more complex molecules such as water and hydrocarbons, and it is the fuel of the stars. Now, when we think of hydrogen involving hazardous areas, we need to think of what considerations is there. Is it a good or bad fuel source? Is it safe? More specifically, what are the competencies of personnel, EPCs, engineering, procurement, and construction, manufacturers and end users, and the human factors? Now, when it comes to hydrogen, there's quite a few advantages. It's readily available, no harmful emissions, environmentally friendly, depends on the source of where it comes from. It's fuel efficient and it's been studied in depth. Now, what are the disadvantages? Well, as a very low minimum ignition energy, and we have to consider many sources of possible ignition, and it has a very flammable characteristic, meaning a wide flammable range. Now, when comparing to other things such as natural gas, it disperses much quicker. It has a high rise speed. It disperses into the air very quickly. It's only most easily ignitable at a 29% concentration in air mixture. Doesn't ignite very easily at a low temperature. It's non-toxic, non-poisonous. But what are the disadvantages? Well, it's odorless, colorless, tasteless. Its explosive range is quite wide. Its ignition energy is very low. The flammability range, once again, is very wide. And when it is on fire, it's a blue flame, which is invisible during the day. So when we talk about hydrogen characteristics, well, let's ask some questions to people and get your input. So this is an anonymous poll, and the intent is to gauge everybody on their thoughts and opinions. So, is hydrogen a dangerous material? Now, this is a multiple choice question. So, there could be one answer or there could be multiple. Once we get up to about 70% voting, I will close the poll. Okay, we're up to 60%, hopefully another 10 seconds and we'll have up to that 70% uh, range. If it's not multiple, I apologize for the uh, program acting up again. 61%, I'm gonna close and share now. Okay, so when we talk about hydrogen, is it dangerous? The correct answers on this one are certainly yes, but no, as long as the material characteristics are understood. It also depends on the process, and it also depends on the potential sources of release. So there is four possible answers. I'm glad nobody said no. It is the, uh, besides acetylene, 
there is probably hydrogen um, carbon disulfide. There's a few other dangerous ones, but this is a very important one. Now, let's ask another question. Can hydrogen be safely used? Once again, this will be multiple choice, hopefully. This is all anonymous, so. Once we get up to 70%, that would be good. So remember, there is no wrong answer, mm, perhaps one, but it really is open up to interpretation. Yes, I know it's not multiple choice on this one. This is on purpose to see people's responses and just to show. So it depends on your role and position and history experience, your own competency. So people will give different answers. 67, 68, there we go, good enough. Okay, can hydrogen be used safely? I would not agree with the blank, uh, straightforward yes answer because it can only be with verification of compliance of, well, the line below, People had the two different choices, they're pretty much the same, but verification of compliance of the hazardous area classification, design, installation, operations, maintenance, and monitoring. I'm glad nobody said that there was no issues in a closed system because closed systems have to be open for, it looks like maintenance, and a few other times. 2% said no. Hmm. Okay, so let's go to, now, where do we get our hydrogen material characteristics from in the hazardous area industry? Well, we go to IEC 80079-20.1, gases and flammable vapors. So when we look there, we find all are different material characteristics, specifically our upper flammable limit, 77%, and lower flammable limit, 4%. Now the ignition temperature is quite low, uh, quite high, 560 degrees. We have our gas group or equipment group, as we say, 2C, and temperature class of T1. But an interesting thing is, there's been many studies done where the minimum ignition energy is 0 0.011 millijoules or 0 0.017 millijoules. So it has a wide range, explosive flammable range. Yeah, low minimum ignition energy, high temperature auto ignition. So if we go back to the questions is, What is the UFL and LFL? So upper flammable limit and lower flammable limit by volume percentage. Be careful with how this was arranged. First, we started with the upper and then the lower. I can see the percentages changing that just now after that. So these are an example of human factors. The chance for human error is high when someone changes something that is not normal. Usually people would start with the lower and then mention the upper. Two answers are more correct than the other. But we just looked at the IECs, 
table on material characteristics for hydrogen. So one answer is more correct than the other. Okay, it's 60%, we'll share that. So the last answer is not correct because we've swapped around UFL and LFL. This is to show how easy it is to trip somebody up on something so straightforward, okay? That was on purpose. Now, the correct answer is the fourth one, 77% and 4%. So the lower flammable limit is 4% and the upper flammable limit is 77. Now, also within the industry, uh, there are uh, other studies that say from five to 74 or four to 74. Okay. Now, why is this significant? Well, when we come to the fire triangle, people usually think of oxygen, fuel, and heat. But the other things we need to consider is what about the competencies of the personnel of using this tape, this triangle? What are the, what is their skills, knowledge, and experience? What qualifications do they have as a precursor to their competence? And what does heat mean to you? So just go back on one question. This is a multiple choice question. There's multiple answers. What is the auto ignition temperature of hydrogen? The multiple answers on this one. There's also Fahrenheit on there. So I think the one or two Americans that are here should uh, catch that. There you go. So this is a perfect example of confusion within the industry. If you're using different units of measurement, you can throw people off. 55% voted, give another 10 seconds. I'm guessing some people are Googling. That is okay. And close and share. Oh, gentlemen, the correct answers are only 560 Celsius and 1040 fahrenheit so as we can see 34 percent got the wrong celsius uh, uh, at 460 and the one at 550 that may have tricked some people because it was so close okay let's just do another one we shall choose Let's see who looked at that characteristic table. What is the relative density of hydrogen in air? Only one answer on this one. So if air has a density of one, think of if something has a higher number, is that lighter than air or heavier than air? Give another 10 seconds, we're at about 50% voting. Sixty percent. Hmm. 
Okay, close that share. So gentlemen, the correct answer is 0 0.07. Hydrogen is lighter than air. It rises at a very rapid pace. So as we can see there, only 43% got that right. And actually 14% uh, said that it was heavier than air. So once again, this is, this is potent, perhaps a potential human factors issue within our industries. Okay. So what does heat mean to you gentlemen and ladies? Now, here's another question on this one. Does this fire triangle consider or include static electricity to you? What does heat mean to you? I gave away the answer, so this will skew the poll. Some people are saying heat does not consider static electricity for one. I see some people are saying the right answer to me in the chat. I agree, but this is learning lessons for everyone. Okay, 70% voted. Okay, now this number was much higher for the number that said no. The problem with the fire triangle is when we say one side only refers to heat, human nature is people only think of open flames and hot things. They do not consider the following 13 plus sources of ignition. Now highlighted in yellow, so when we're replace one side of the fire triangle to ignition source, that would probably get people's attention much more than heat or flames. So what's highlighted in yellow would usually be electrical considerations, such as hot surfaces of our hazardous area equipment, electrical equipment and lights, obviously, spontaneous heating, sparks from electrical equipment, stray currents, electrostatic discharge sparks, also known as static electricity, lightning strikes, electromagnetic radiation, EMC, EM, different, different optical radiation, things like that. Now, when we consider mechanical, well, obviously there's mechanical machinery, machinery and other ones, but also heated process vessels, yeah, and vehicles. Well, what vehicles is there? Well, on a ship, a vessel, an OSV, offshore platform, offshore vessel, you have intrinsically safe forklifts for this very reason. So in the center there, you can see a junction box full of corrosion. Would there perhaps be arcing and sparking going on in the terminals? or perhaps static buildup? I would say yes. So water ingress, duct ingress, can cause further issues with potential ignition sources. Now, quick question. This one was from our webinar number two. Hopefully people can get this one right. What is the equipment group or gas group to define hydrogen? Whether it be on the data plate, the EX data plate, or on the hazardous area classification drawing? There's multiple answers to this one. Don't be shy. Forty, fifty percent. Hopefully, another ten seconds. Oh, there we go. Sixty percent. The more, the better, please.
So can you mark a motor for a gas group just saying that it's H2 or the word hydrogen? Hmm. And close. So for the Americans, they got their group B down there on the bottom. I don't expect uh, internationals uh, outside of North America to always get that. Now the answer, anybody who gave the answer to 2B, that is not correct. Hydrogen is not part of the 2B gas group, but it is part of 2C and it is allowed to be highlighted as 2B plus H2, or there is a consideration, let's say a motor has been manufactured and tested only for use in hydrogen, you can mark it as H2 or the word hydrogen. 60079-0, section 29 markings. It is allowed. Okay. So, sources of ignition. We got many different types. Here's a question for you guys. Can clothing cause ignition of hydrogen? I'm liking the uh, responses so far. We're about 40, 50% in. I think this one's skewed because we have a lot of people from uh, hazardous area industries that have a lot of experience and they're used to the type of clothing that they receive. 72%, another five seconds. Okay, so 10% said no. Gentlemen, static electricity. Yeah, hydrogen has igniting. It only takes 0 0.017 or 16 millijoules of energy to ignite. So, So when we talk about known issues with hydrogen, what are we looking at? Well, we know that there is issue, issues within confined spaces, such as battery rooms, like on the bottom picture there, machinery spaces, enclosed environments, offshore. The design has to take into account ventilation, gas detection, what's its layout? What are its high, 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 and high, high alarms? Earthing and bonding. Hmm. Ignition source reduction. I wonder what that earthing and bonding is for. Ventilation. Is it natural? Is it artificial? Does it have redundant systems? Now, what still must be hazardous area has lock in this battery room? Well, anything that turns that stays on after power loss ups systems emergency systems also things that must work to turn the ventilation back on your control your card access your access into the room your fire and gas and your safety instrument si systems as well as your battery transfer switch now known issues in the industry well back in may of 2019 in Illinois, in America, hmm, human-induced faults. The employer either knowingly failed to comply with the legal requirements purposely, purposely disregarded or acted with plain indifference to employee safety. Now, there was a buildup of hydrogen in the ceiling space, and there was an explosion that killed four people. I would disagree with OSHA and CSB's findings, I would put it down to human induced faults. But many times people believe they're right. So they're not purposely disregarding what was supposed to be done. They believe they are in the right. 
they did a risk assessment or ignorance. Ignorance meaning they did not know. But when it comes to court or dealing with regulatory bodies, well, ignorance is not a defense you will ever win with. So, let's see how many people can get this one. What important factors must be considered when a facility involves hydrogen, whether it be a new facility or an existing facility? This is multiple choice. So process type would mean, what is the hydrogen being used for? Is it for power? Is it for cooling? Is it a off gas that's not needed, not wanted? What about the ac accuracy of the hazardous area classification? Has it been done by qualified or competent people? What about atm atmospheric conditions? Temperature, wind, salt atmospheres, the type of ventilation, potential sources of release. Sixty percent. I'd like to get another ten, hopefully. Okay, we'll close that. So, what are our correct answers? Well, you do have to consider the process type. The accuracy of the hazardous carrier classification, well, that's very important. The extent of your zones for the design engineers to correctly select it. Who created the hack? Was it one engineer? Did you put all of the responsibilities on that one engineer? What is, what is his background? Does he have mechanical, process, chemical, electrical, instrument, safety? Does he have all those competencies? That's a high task to ask of someone. And also atmospheric conditions. Now, the 7% that said classification is not needed if there are no sources of release. How did you assess if there was no sources of release if you did not do a hazardous area classification. If there is hydrogen, you do an ignition hazard assessment and an area classification. So if you create a hazardous area classification saying that there is no hazardous area, you've done a hazardous area classification. If you say that a classification is not needed, you will be putting yourself and the facility, the end user, and the operators, everyone at risk. Please do not choose that option ever. Because, well, we have evidence. This one here in Illinois, their design of their system was insufficient. They all thought the employer or acted with plain indifference for employees. No, actually, they thought everything was okay. They thought they did their due diligence. Somebody said top, uh, some battery rooms only have the top 25% classified by the hazardous area. Is this correct? It's one method. There are many methods of how to do it. Is it correct? Case by case analysis needs to happen. Now, static. Anybody who disagreed with the importance of static electricity, well, there's a technical specification put out by the IEC as part of 60079 series, you know, as there's atmospheres. So where do we have static? Anywhere there's a potential difference. So we've already seen explosions with people fueling up at fuel stations or tanker trucks where they make that connection, where you have process barrels, as you can see everything highlighted here, we are bringing everything to 
an equal potential to drain off any static electricity to prevent ignition. And then all over the world, at least in Europe and Australia and a few other places, we have anti-static clothing. If you shuffle your feet on the ground, uh, on carpet or you know even your own clothes, you can build up a potential source of ignition. Once again, it only takes 0 0.011 or 0 0.017 millijoules to ignite. Now, let's ask a question on what we just talked about, what I mentioned. Who shall be considered for an explosion risk assessment and a hazardous area classification? Multiple choice. Now, when you're considering static, this is part of the explosion risk assessment. Thirty percent. Hopefully, we can get up to seventy again. Fifty-seven. Okay, let's share now. The most correct answers that myself would choose would be the bottom two. Definitely all the uh, discipline engineers and a meteorologist and include safety in there. But the 19% that said the process or chemical engineer is sufficient, what do they know about hazardous areas? What do they know about electrical and instrumentation and operations. Have they considered all of the environmental conditions? Lightning strikes? Who knows that? Meteorologists. But who knows the earthing systems? The electricians. But what about the instrument earthing systems and the intrinsically safe earthing systems? Well, that'd be the instrument guy. Who knows how the plant operates mechanically? probably the operations or mechanical engineer. So I would not choose just the process or chemical engineer. And the 31% who say, just do as the company says, as they've chosen, if you're involved with the, in a hazardous area classification, or even you're just an inspector, for my own well-being, I would check to see whom has done the hazardous area classification. We've already seen in our industry, human factors are 99.9% .9 of all faults. An act of God is very rare. Now, static. Well, a static charge can be measured in millijoules. Typically, you need one millijoule to feel a shock, 10 to 30 to make you flinch, and 1,350 to kill you. Shuffling across a carpet can generate 10 to 25 millijoules, just 1 to 2% of a lethal jolt. You might generate more at a car. I'm sure all of us have seen a vehicle light up on fire because somebody maybe was using their cell phone or even their clothing just created enough of a static charge. So, and also you have to take into account your maximum body capacitance and humidity. So if hydrogen has a minimum ignition energy of 0 0.017 millijoules and we only feel one millijoule. Wonder why those battery rooms always blow up if uh, a little bit of static electricity is somehow produced. 
there's a reason why we wear certain types of clothing even in that space. Now that rack may be perfectly earthed, but one little static discharge at a charging battery at its vent, a VLRA and many of the other types of batteries produce hydrogen and it comes out the vent. Even with dispersion, it still has potential and it still happens yearly or every few years within our industry. Now, when we talk about the hydrogen economy, it's quite big. Well, renewable energy. Well, the nuclear is now starting to talk about producing hydrogen. Yeah, they have excess energy, heat, electricity. So it's very easy to turn the water, well, in the hydrogen and oxygen. So from fossil fuels, we already know about hydrogen. It's in our process. We are well aware and well competent with it. But not everybody in the facility knows hazardous areas. So why do we have these explosions? Well, lack of awareness. As we've already seen from people's answers during this presentation, not everybody is aware. So what other things shall happen? Well, the hydrogen grid, as more people are utilizing hydrogen specifically in itself, yeah, we have new hydrogen bulk carriers. We already know about LNG, liquid natural gas carriers and crude oil tankers, but now there are hydrogen bulk carriers. We already know about the hydrogen buses and cars, but now we also have hydrogen ferries and their fuel source is hydrogen. Yeah, the bulk carrier moves it between countries while we have other ones that are now using it as a fuel source. Even the bulk carrier could use the hydrogen as its fuel source. So, when we think about hydrogen and we know that it creates hazardous areas, what standards are we applying around the world? Generally, we're looking at ATEX, IECX, or different variations of it. Europe always had ATEX, America and Canada had their own. NEC 500, 505, and then Canada has more moved into the zoning method. Now, within Australia waters, we have a regulatory body called NOPSEMA. They call for everything to be IECX or ATEX with uh, certain deviations. Within America, onshore, they do accept IECX, but you have to meet their local electrical requirements. And they still use classes and divs where they won't accept IECX. Now, when it comes to offshore, well, recently, the Coast Guard was made the, they were the AHJ, the authority holding jurisdiction, and it was announced in 2015 that as of April the 1st, 2018, any new builds, anything new coming into US waters shall be IECX certified for their electrical equipment, not the mechanical yet. So there are differences between onshore and offshore. The first ones to do it were the Australians with an offshore regulator in a uh, well-known capacity. There may be other countries that have done it differently. So what set of standards do we have and use? Well, typically onshore, when we consider around the world, Canada, sometimes in America. They, in America, they'll use UL or FM or ISA 60079. It's 90% similar, but there are key differences. In the rest of the world, we follow ENIEC, European norm and IEC set of 60079, explosive atmospheres. 
Here we have classifications, installation, design, selection, and erection, and installation and maintenance. It's also repair. Now, when we talk about modules, mobile and fixed offshore units, such as FPSOs, jackups, semi subs, floaters, and fixed facilities, we now aren't talking about IEC 61892. It talks about hazardous areas and makes reference back to 60079. Now, what do we have for the tankers, the bulk carriers, the ships carrying hydrogen or using hydrogen as a fuel source? Well, there's another set of standards, IEC 60092. These, once again, make reference back to IEC 60079. Onshore, offshore, production and um, exploration, and offshore, movement of vessels, and as fuel. So, let's ask another question. What should be done first? A has up, has it. So hazardous, um, looking for hazards, uh, doing your hazard assessment for your overall facility. So this could be a, a new facility or brownfield facility. Or would you do your ignition hazard analysis and your hazardous area classification? Would you do one first, then the other? Or would you do them at the same time? Would you have a common team? Or would it all be the exact same group? Safety professionals will have one answer that I can guarantee. But perhaps they don't have the awareness of hazardous areas. 52%. Give another 10 seconds. Okay. So the most correct answer, which would be the most efficient, cost-effective, high quality, safe, would be at the same time, generally by a common team. You do your hazardous area classification with all the exact same positions as the HAZOP. You have safety, mechanical, process, chemical, electrical, and instrumentation groups doing both of those assessments. But the problem is some people believe that a hazardous area classification and a niche and hazard analysis can only be, only needs to be done by one person. That has led to the multiple problems in the industry, which you will see in the next slide, because human factors, human induced faults. So, what is the point of having two teams that maybe you have a common team or maybe the same group? Communication, no siloing. There is no barriers between people and communication. So anybody who said the ignition hazard analysis first, that is what you do first before your final hazardous area classification. But for those who said just the HAZOP first, that is an industry issue where the HAZOP and the functional safety are considered. But if you choose a SIL-3 piece of equipment, a gas detector, but you forget to select its correct EX protection technique, well, it can detect gas, but if it's not EX, it could also ignite the gas. 
Some people say you don't have the information at the same time. Yes, this is a honest assessment. It is also anonymous for anybody who will be watching this later. It's for people to see the competencies, the answers. So don't don't feel bad if your answer is different than what you think after hearing a response. Once again, it's all anonymous. So why do we have the development of EX standards for ships, bulk carriers? Well, also onshore. Well, we have history, bad history. Deepwater Horizon, top one on the right. Montara Oil Platform, Australia, 2009. Piper Alpha, 1987, 1988, roughly. That one killed, I think, into the hundreds. Montara, nobody dead. 50 or more days spill. And we know 14 or more dead on the Deepwater Horizon. So what was the common cause? Once again, human factors, human-induced faults. It'll be okay. That won't happen. I've never seen that before. Drill, 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 baby, drill. We got to get this done. 1986 for Piper Alpha, 186 on Piper Alpha, one more the next day. Thank you. So the thing is, guys, most of the faults, most of everything that can go wrong, will go wrong, is caused by us people. This is the reason we have standards and quality management systems, because we can't expect everybody to remember everything. Not all of us are Einstein. It, it, that, that's not practicable. But what we can do is bring all information together in a simple format that hopefully all of us can refer to. We can have verified and validated information. Now, offshore, what's happened in the industry? Well, in Australia, due to the Montar oil platform, not SEMA was created. They're offshore regulator. Now, they were created 2011 or so. I might be off by a year or two. But their disaster happened before Deepwater Horizon. So what happened? Well, Deepwater Horizon happened, and in 2015, it was announced that by 2018, the US Coast Guard would be the AHJ, the authority holding jurisdiction, for a lot of the MODUs, mobile offshore drilling units, OSVs, offshore support vessels, they would be responsible for the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, as to which standards apply offshore. The US Coast Guard does not permit the use of IATEX fully. It requires IECX certification. Once again, all new builds. New construction must have a HAZOP plan. In the international community, we know this as an EX register or hazardous area register or verification dossier. Yeah, they refer to in their code for federal regulation 46 CFR 110.25-1. Once again, they call for IECX certificates of conformity. There are all also other requirements to electrical codes. Okay, so NEC calls for qualified people for classification, design, installation, inspection, maintenance, operation. All the same as the standards that we talked about before. So if we ask the question, we didn't go over this, but just want to get people's intrinsic opinions what forms of release need to be considered let's say for hydrogen so what form we mean solid liquid vapor gas what state that it is in how it's released multiple choice 
let's just say there is no answer that is wrong. I hope that changes all the answers. When is hydrogen a liquid? Hmm. Don't we uh, get the vessels up to about 700 bar in a hydrogen vehicle? Okay. So, gentlemen, the answer is all of them. Hydrogen can be a gas. It can be a liquid under pressure, such as in a hydrogen-fueled vehicle. It can also be a liquid under refrigeration. Well, we use hydrogen, such as for the nuclear industry, for the turbine, it's used as a coolant. Does it act as a vapor or is it a vapor? Yeah, at certain points. And when is it a liquid? Well, at very low temperatures. So you'd probably be looking at uh, extreme cooling of like super uh, capacitors. But all of them are relevant. But not everybody will consider it because perhaps it's not in their industry and they don't think about it. Okay. Now for hydrogen, what or where are the sources of potential release? So for the hazardary classification, where can hydrogen leak from? So in a closed system, non-atmospheric process, can it leak or does it not leak? Twenty-three percent voted. Obviously, this one's a very heavy area class has this area classification question. Not everybody has the experience in this, but as an inspector or technician or installer, you are meant to understand has this area classification. Did your training give you enough awareness? Perhaps, perhaps not. Sixty-two percent will share that. So, the last four answers are the correct answers. Anybody that says that a fully sealed system will never leak hydrogen, I'll ask, how do you do maintenance? There's no opening point. Is it fully welded, fully closed? You'll never be able to get into it ever. That doesn't sound like a very good design for uh, operations. Even a uh, nuclear power plant, there's always access points for maintenance, for shutdown turnarounds. Yeah. If an instrument is mounted, that mounting point is a potential source for release. Any access point is a potential source of release, especially flanges and valves. So if you don't have any valves, I don't, I don't know how you have a fully enclosed process. Do you just have a pipe that goes around in a circle with hydrogen in it? Not gonna have that. Okay. One more question, then we'll get to, no, that's all our questions. So, hydrogen is a, quotation, safe fuel source. When someone says this, you really need to think for yourself, what is the competence of this person? Have they considered all the necessary risks, the consequences and likelihoods? Do they, do they understand the purpose of standardization? And what are the chances of human factors being an issue in them saying that hydrogen is a safe fuel source? Well, when Dr. Thorsten Arnold, Arnold says that it's safe, well, 
he was the IECX chairman from 2014 to 2019. He is a gentleman that knows hazardous area standards at an expert level. So when he says it, yes. But the problem is, is when the general person hears it, human nature is, we just believe it. Which is true if you have the competencies in hazardous areas and working with hydrogen. But when a random person says it because they've heard it, it can cause problems in our industry. Yeah, I've, I've always done it this way. It's okay. I've never seen a problem. We showed you a few hydrogen problems. This Friday, we will be doing a presentation on explosions involving hydrogen. There have already been four in the last year and a half or two years within America and other locations in the world, but four specifically in America. So, gentlemen, I want to thank you. We'll now move into the question period. I want to thank you very much for going through this. This one, it was a lot more heavy in depth with the questions. That was on purpose to challenge people, but in an anonymous way. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, this one was a lot more in depth than uh, previous webinars. Is there any fire safety protection code for hydrogen? Yes, there are existing standards, which are the hazardous area standards. Hydrogen is a potentially explosive gas. Yes within the significant with sufficient mixture with air so we would refer to depending on where your installation is we would refer to the relevant hazardous area standard it could be that you're within america or australia so you would refer to your local national nationalized version of the standard now, when it comes to fire safety, that could be another standard. Then you also have to take into account electrical standards. So within America, there would be NEC, the National Electrical Code put out by the NFPA, National Fire Protection Agency. In Australia, you would have AS3000, Australian Electrical Standards. Can VLR battery, VLRA batteries considered a as a solution to minimize hydrogen release in a battery room so people use vlra batteries instead of nicad or uh, other ones because they have a reduced level of hydrogen output it can be a solution but still you need to do a ignition hazard analysis and hazardous area classification now you you can use safety systems to lessen the risk or you can use proper ventilation well you would have to but you could increase the ventilation amount the amount of air the volume changes per hour to lower the overall volume within the volume of hydrogen through dispersion dispersing it with reference to the poll does this mean someone qualified as a mechanical engineer will not be allowed to carry out a hack alone. No, that's not what's being said. We are giving consideration showing that does a chemical engineer have the competencies to do the ignition hazard assessment? Do they know all the different earthing systems? Ask yourself that question. Do they need to carry out hack with someone from another engineering discipline such as meteorological instrumentation or mechanical engineer. 
The standard highly suggests that, saying should, depending on the standard. You have standards in different regions. Some will say should, some will say shall, some will say could. What would be safest and best overall would be yes, do it as a team effort. The HAZA, the HAZID, already includes all of those engineers doing that as part of their um, figuring out their safety integrity level requirements. Yeah, SIL and SIF. So why not utilize their expertise for the hazardous area classification? When geometric shapes to be used for interpretation for an explosive zone. Yeah, so geometrical shape will affect, obviously with hydrogen, hydrogen will go up at a rapid pace and can get trapped in roof spaces, in hidden areas where perhaps earthing has not been done or there is, once again, 13 different types of ignition sources, yeah? Even more than 13. So things need to be well designed. If it's a thin cylinder or an inverted cone, I think you're talking about a specific process. It would depend where that cone or cylinder is installed. If it's outside, is it a uh, area of the world where there's a lot of um, wind or not? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is there walls or buildings perhaps shielding the location from wind? Is there any treatment, any treatment able, uh, available to reduce hydrogen gas after hydro generation process? Any other alternative methods rather than to vent it to atmosphere directly? Well, you can vent it higher up away from any potential sources of ignition. You can dilute it by dispersing it. Yeah, you can, if it's inside of a, a, a room, such as this battery room, you had to have forced ventilation would be, would be good, but you have to have backup. But by dispersing it, you would want to get it below 1% LEL and you'd wanna get it outside and above any electrical equipment or potential ignition sources. Any other method than to vent into atmosphere? Um, there is also gas detectors, so you can use that, but you would have to have it, they would have to be specifically sill rated and there's a lot of uh, shutdown logic involved and once you get to that 1%, so you have to have 25% of the LEL of hydrogen. So 25% of 4% is 1%. So you would be required to shut down anything that is not EX protected. So your battery transfer switch, things like that would probably always be EX protected and in the room. How safe are hydrogen fueling stations really? General public will not consider static uh, dangers, in my personal opinion. There have been explosions um, within the last few months and the last few years involving hydrogen fueling stations. We will list those on Friday and we'll show some of these videos. It's the same thing as a petrol station. We have static discharge causing ignition while people are fueling. And that's not even while they're using a piece of electronic equipment. It's just the static electricity from their clothing. Not all vehicles are significantly, um, are sufficiently uh, earthed. And people don't know to where to touch to um, bring themselves to potential. Okay, any other questions? Or with that, we will close the question period. Are they very similar for LNG fueling? So obviously with LNG, 
you have methane and, and you know a few other gases so those gases different uh, you know different gas groups different mies minimum ignition energy um different dispersion rates uh, different flammability explosive ranges so they're not as stringent of a requirement as hydrogen but still they are stringent in what really needs to be done where it needs to be safe we don't want another hyper alpha or anything like that because every single time when we look at this hydrogen economy second So when we look at hydrogen economy, think about the fueling of all these tanks, vessels, buses, chemical plants. Every single time we are transferring hydrogen, we're making a connection. So it's a temporary connection. That's your primary, probably a primary source, primary, um, release point, perhaps secondary, depending on which type of flange it is, what type of connection it is. Are there any requirements for battery rooms? Yes, a ignition hazard analysis must be done and a hazardous area classification assessment. Now, if, if you define it as non-hazardous, remember there is no safe areas, it's non-hazardous. If it's a non-hazardous area, well, you would still produce the hazardous area classification drawing to show why with the relevant data sheet and justification for that. Okay, any more questions? Apologies for those who stuck around that it went longer. Um, we just wanted to answer people all, all people's questions. But this one was very uh, in depth. The one on Friday will be much easier. It'll be more videos and more awareness of past explosions. Any H2 transportation ships fall down under ABS requirements? The industry is quickly advancing as to if there is any failures to meet standards based on human nature i would say there was some and based on human nature i could see a point being lack of awareness people not applying the standards because they don't think they apply or they think another one applies or their own interpretation so the chances of something going wrong, well, it's there, it's there. And as people rush into things, there's a higher chance of things happening. There have already happened on shore with hydrogen within the last few months, multiple times, actually the other day. Thank you very much. Um, everybody that attended, we will have, as I said, on Friday, a list of explosive events involving hydrogen that have, have happened. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your time. Have a wonderful 